All right, man. How are you? I'm good. How'd it go cutting out that foam? You have a chance to? I, I haven't got to the foam yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, the real job is keeping me away from the fun job. So but oh. I did I did some other things um this week and I ran into a little problem that I'm really not sure what to do about. Yeah. Well, what's so up? I was everything I'd cut so far was like perfect. Couldn't ask for anything better. Awesome. And I did this last project that I did was kind of a rectangular 14, 14 tall, 12 wide, put it on the machine, perfectly level, perfectly straight. Um, but when it cut, it cut at an angle. I mean, the whole project was the right shape. It didn't skew the pro the whole thing skewed, you know, about five degrees. And it ran in, you know, it ended up off my workpiece and into my apron. So I wasn't very happy about that. But um yeah. not sure what caused it. So yeah, sometimes the slanting, it comes from the calibration, like those main calibration settings getting offset. So like when was the last time that you like did an edge calibration? Has it been a long time since you went through and done that? Or like put those numbers, you know, the copy and pasted numbers in there? Yeah, I haven't I haven't done an edge calibration since before my first project. Okay, so I bet that's it. So usually the slanting, it comes from uh, the M2, like losing the place where it is. So it doesn't know exactly where home is. So it starts miscalculating its travels. So it'll slant like either this direction or that direction because it's miscalculating as it's moving in X, Y, how much uh, feed it needs to give to each one of the motors. So it'll start to kind of slant in one direction or another because it's kind of lost place on where it is. So it's kind of lost that calibration with the sled to the material to the frame itself. That's usually the most common part. The next one is that it could be um, like a if it's really bad, this is probably not it, but if it's a really bowed like plywood or something like that, that can cause it to kind of go up and down and ebb and flow as well. But that's that's probably not it with you. I would doubt that. No, it's like um, flat flat. Yeah. So because the especially over like a long space, that's the the most common occurrence is that like that slight angle or slight degree that it does. And that's something that they've been having trouble trying to program and like really hone in and fix in the new version of Makerverse. And one of the things I've been working on too is to try to help that to for it to keep its location more. So I would suggest going through and doing an edge calibration again and like making sure like when you say home, uh, you know, it, it and resetting your chains first, like move, you know, it back up to that mark chains and reset the chains and then go through like an edge calibration and then try uh, again and see how that right. works. But I know that like, you know, trying again and cutting another material isn't ideal either. So you could try something that's smaller, um, like a square or something like that, that you, you could even put like a pencil in the router and have it just kind of trace around on something so it wouldn't waste your material again. And you could even do that on top of the material that you currently have. And that could help too, because then that would kind of tell you how how it's looking and how how it's moving around um and that edge calibration too just going through that you know maybe one maybe even two or three times can help it really just home in where it all is again in where the chains are and where your material lives if that makes yeah. sense yeah so this morning i did edge calibration and i yeah. did a z z calibration it just loses it like over time when you're doing cut after cut after cut it can it can lose where it is and lose like exactly that point on your material uh mm -hmm. and your frame on where it's cutting from so that's what that's what i would suggest is is doing that and then using that that material to that scrap material like was it still usable like even though it was kind oh, of yeah sick? okay i mean i know there's a problem with it but nobody else is gonna see it okay great well that, that's good yeah so um that's that's most probably uh most likely the culprit is going through that so resetting the chains and and if like has it been a long time to so reset the chains too I've never reset chains. Okay. Like, so, this is my first time. So you could do that maybe, maybe before we even edge calibration. It's just, you know, moving those motors back up to 12 o'clock where they're marked on your chains and mm -hmm. hitting reset chains. And then that uh, could help a lot too because like hitting that reset chain just kind of refreshes all of those settings back to where they were when you first did the chain calibration. So okay. you could even do that instead of going through that whole edge calibration, like do the reset change, see how it kind of looks. And then if you need to go in and do an edge calibration, you can. But those would be the two things that are the most likely culprit. Because it's just, you know, 
cutting over and over again or losing power on and uh, over and over again. It's just over time, it can kind of lose track of exactly where it is in the Arduino and the programming and it's thinking that it's in a place that it's not. And it, that's why we recommend kind of doing that periodically when you start seeing weird stuff happening. Okay, I'll do that. I was gonna shorten my chains anyway, because I just have too much chain. So- Do you have the 15 foots? Hmm? Do you have the 15 foots? I do, and there's probably 16 extra inches. Part of, the, part of the problem I have right now is the chains and the spring sag down so far. This morning, in fact, when I was calibrating it, my left motor started double wrapping because the chain got caught in the chain. Yeah. I didn't notice it until it was wrapped about five turns. Yeah, I ended up having my yeah. wife come out and hit the button while I just kind of manually pulled it out. So I want to put my pulley system back in place, get rid of the spring, but I need to shorten the, the chains to do that. Yeah. And there's you know, I ran it down to the bottom corners and up to the top corners and kind of measured the chains out. There's like an easy 16 inches I can pick out of each side. Do you have a 10 foot beam or a 12 foot beam? 12 foot. 12 foot. Okay. So you can try moving the nail around too. Like one yeah. of the old Maslow tricks is you can put the nail on the back side of the board and that can take away some of that slack too, as you're moving around. Like you can, you know, completely wrap it around as long as it's on the motor and put it on that back side so you can kind of adjust where those chains are and that uh like those nails are and that will adjust where your spring is so that can help as well um but yeah if you if you want to do it like a chain breaker or something like that you can you can you can break them but just make sure that it's perfect before you go and break them like you can zip tie them up um like you can just pull them through the like roll bearing carriages up on your sled Mm -hmm. uh you can pull them through that and then zip tie it back to itself until you're absolutely certain and then before you break them so because you know you had to be in a situation where like you need a little bit more slack and then you can't get it yeah that's what i was going to do is just move my i've got a split ring that's holding the end of the the uh chain to a yeah. bolt because i'm using i've got a steel beam oh so yeah that's right it on and then and then uh i just i'll just put my uh split ring through where i want it on the chain Give it a try, see what happens. That's good. That works. That'll be great. Yeah. Cause then you're not actually like breaking the chains and having to go back and you can experiment more. And yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'll do that. It should be easy. Right on. Yeah. Cause you want to try to have it to, but it, it does, it's not completely like slack down where, you know, it's going to wrap around your motors or the chain's going to, or the uh, spring is going to get in the way of your sled as it's moving around. Um, you, you want to have some sort of tension on there, which helps to keep it on the motors, which is why the, like the spring, uh, helps instead of having to do weights and pulley systems and stuff like that, uh, in general. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's know how it goes. Yeah, I will. Yeah. So, Hey Rob. Hey man. How's it going, Patrick? That's all right. Oh, I'm actually, I'm not Patrick. Let me change my name. I'm Drew. Oh. <laughs> I'll change it right I, now. I remember you from last time. I guess uh, I didn't. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it's it, the name is just automatically Patrick. Um, <laughs> but yeah, what what, uh, what can I help you all with? How's it going, man? So um, I started cutting my first big file a couple of weeks back um, on the M2, awesome. and I um, it cut first half of the project real nice, and then. Um, and it was a long cut. It's probably about four hours. And um, about halfway through the project, uh, everything just kind of froze up. And I ran it again, and it froze up in the exact same place. And before I go like changing anything, I wanted to re-upload um, the design from, um, I'm forgetting the name of the software right now, where you need the premium version. Easel? Do some stuff. Is it easel? Yes. yes. Okay. So my yeah. easel subscription had uh, expired. And so I wasn't able to re-upload the design. And I'm wondering if it's something in that program that made it freeze. Probably so. Yeah. So if it when it froze, did it disconnect or did it just sit there? No. And it, it just sat like, there. And just yeah, yeah it's just like I told it to sit in that position for three hours. So and wasn't gonna uh, that does sound like it's something in the G code. Um, so you could look at that. So if you go, you know, there in the side, I mean, it's probably too late now, but um, 
you can see like the lines of code. So like mm -hmm. now on the right side of Makerverse, it's kind of got those lines of code on where it's going through. And it gives you kind of like time elapsed. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Like walking you through that. Yeah. So it's it like reads through those lines of code and gives an estimate that's usually kind of off on how long it's going to take. And uh, it starts to go down, just trying to, it's trying to judge how long it's going to take to go through and make everything. And you can look at that line, like if it says I'm in line, you know, 57,208 or something, then you could go and actually open that G code file on your computer in like WordPad or Notepad. And then you can do like a, a command F or control F and then type that in that 52,708 is what I said, whatever that last one is. And it will go down to that line. And then you'll see if that's the last line in the code. And if it is, then it like the, the file like didn't quite save correctly and it like left off the last part, or it might have a command in there, like a like a tool change command or something like that. Like if you could hit resume, like could you hit resume? Would it do anything? No, or did I, it completely just stop? And then it was like back to where you needed to completely play the program again. Like did it pause or did it stop? I guess is what I'm trying to ask. You know, it's been a couple of weeks now, um, so I don't exactly remember, but uh, I have enough bare space that I can let, uh, you know, start over uh, with the second half of that chair yeah. and see where it goes. And I'll take your advice on that. Okay, cool. Yeah, and you can try to, like, if you if it's already cut out part of it, you can you can just set it again because it's going to trace that same path. And it That's just what I hope. won't be cutting. And then it'll trace that same path. And then when it gets to where it's cutting again, or it gets to the end of it, then you'll be like, oh, here it is. And then you'll know exactly where that line is. You can you can go and you can look at it. Um, and you could also use, there's other G-Codes uh, creators out there, like Carbide Create is one that you can use too. Really? And Carbide Create's free too. So you can okay. use that one if you want to switch from that to Easel. I think, Ren, that's the one you use, right? Yeah, I like Carbide Create better than Easel. It's a little more robust. Oh. Yeah, okay. you want to sure. tell Rob about it a little bit, about why you like it? I don't have to talk the whole time. Uh, I like it because it's got more versatility in what you can actually create in it. I started just doing fonts in it. And okay. uh, then the next thing, I mean, it, it worked. It was easier for me to create any kind of a sign in it because of the fonts um, and how easy it was to do fonts in it. And then I started doing some other um, creations. And so I was using like Inkscape, but you got to turn it into an oh. SVG file. So I bring it in to try to bring it into... Um, easel and it was harder and i brought it into carbon create it was much easier and it made made making the the turning the svg file into g code a lot easier the other thing i like about it is um it's got a whole bunch it's got a library of tools of like bits mm -hmm. but i went in and i can actually put my own bit in there with my own dimensions get up um, all right it's got my name it you, you have to use their naming convention but that way I know exactly what bit I've got. I don't have to guess. Um, so I've got a section that says M2 and the bits for my, that I'm using. That's pretty um, cool. It is, uh, I, it was just easier for me. I mean, everybody likes different software, but that's what worked for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Easel, like they have that free trial version, but it gets, it's kind of clunky. Like when you go back to the free version and yeah, yeah that's, yeah, it's nice to have with free stuff. And, and we want to really have a, a G code creator is something that we're working on that we can create G code inside of Makerverse. So you could just load your file into Makerverse. And that's something that we're working on too as 2.0 as well. So we can actually like make that G code in there, just make that step easier. So you don't have to go to like that third party program and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's definitely something that we're working on as well. But yeah, you could try Carbide Create and that could help. And you maybe even the same G code, like if this one doesn't work and you can't see why, um, you can always send that G code to us too and support. So support at MakerMade. You can send us really? your G code and and be like, hey, it stopped. What's could you see maybe what's wrong with it? And then we can look and see if there might be like a tool change or something like that in there. Especially if you like okay. know around when it stopped, like the the line, like if if it says it, you know, stopped on line 57,000 or whatever, you could say that and let us know and send us a support ticket, and then we can go and open it, check it out, and see if we can diagnose exactly like why it happened. Um, beautiful so those like logs and stuff like that are, are helpful too and i think makerverse has an error log too um that i think that if it's still the same instance of makerverse running i think joel can get a maker log out of that about what it said but i'm not 100 percent sure don't hold me hey, hey. these but are think, all great uh, solutions yeah i'm pretty sure you can um 
get a log from Makerverse because then it would like it would say what Makerverse said, you know. So right. Makerverse would be like, oh, now this happened, um, you know. So you could like get that that both the log and the G code, and then just don't close Makerverse if it happens. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure there's a log feature. Let me log in there, and not, I'll, I'll see here in a second if I can. I think there is. I think I ran into it by accident one day. And, yeah, and like, Rob, there's, sure. there's a couple other things to look for and, and watch. What kind of machine are you running on? Is it a Windows machine or Mac? So I um, I have both. I was running it on a Windows machine, but it's an older Windows machine. And I'm getting a newer, like a new to me Mac uh, in about a week. And that's probably what I'll use going forward. So one of the things to watch out for is screensavers and timeouts oh. on your um on your COM port, especially on Mac. Um, they'll automatically shut off your COM port after a few minutes. Oh, and so yeah. if, you know, well, it depends uh, on how it's set up in your machine. Mine was set up to turn the COM port off after an hour. And I bet I you that's it. it. I had to that go in it and too. turn it on so it would stay on all the time. And and no screensaver, no go to sleep, with or without uh, a cord to it, you know, battery or not. Mm -hmm. And and then the other thing I just found out yesterday, and I didn't know, I'm out in the shop and I was, normally when I'm running something, I've got another project that I can work on on table saw or wherever. Yesterday I didn't have anything. So I was just going to read the news. So I did the, uh, the alt tab to go to my other uh, screen, my other, uh, to my news program. And Makerverse saw that alt and it said unknown command. And it stopped the whole project right there. So oh, then I just had to go back and hit the play button again, and it just picked up where it left off. But hmm. um, just some quirky things, you know? Yeah, the, the screensaver one, that is, that's a, a big one, too. It's like if the computer goes to sleep, then, yeah, it can cause, it can cause some problems because it loses its connection. That's why I asked you if it, like, looked like it lost its connection because that would show that it's, it's going to sleep. Huh. All right. Well, that, uh, that's like a revelation there. Awesome. <laughs> cool. Um, my next question, if you, uh, if everyone's cool with moving on real quick. Um, yeah. I have uh, also a 300X and I just got it up and running two nights ago. Awesome. Um, <laughs> it is pretty great. I need to figure out how to change retraction set. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there's, there's mine right there. Nice. Yeah. Um, retraction settings. I've got, oh, where is it? Here's my Benchy from uh, last night. And uh, you can yeah. see right in the middle. Yeah, it's got some, some screen in there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I tried to download Cura from my laptop and I need a newer version of, I need uh, like 13 or 14.1 or something like that. And so mm -hmm. I can't look at what I need to look at right now, but where would I go about changing retraction settings? So you can do that in uh, in, in Cura or like Prusa Slicer or whatever slicer that you're using, that, mm -hmm. that's where you would change that. So um, you can change with the onboard slicer if you're using that, uh, you can change the temperature, but we don't have a retraction setting in there. It's in there, but it's that's gonna be a next update where we're gonna have all kinds of new features and stuff that's gonna have yeah. that. It's actually Cura engine. Um, but inside of Cura, like when you slice your, your STL file, you'll see uh, like in those settings is where you can change that. And it'll have like the default of retraction is in there. But the thing with retraction is it is set for PLA and the PLA that we tested it with uh, was called push plastic PLA was the one that that was originally tested with then different brands of PLA have different retraction settings even different colors like it's insane because it's just different types of materials and things like that so like that makes sense. It, yeah it, so it could be if you got stringing it's from mm -hmm. re retraction from uh, like the filament maybe being too hot as well like if it's melting some so um, if it's that would be the first thing that you could try is like turning it down to maybe 200. So 220 is like a catch-all. That's why like um, I, I fell on that when I, I I made the profile too, by the way. So oh, um, all right. So like well, I went to 220 because that melts like all kinds of different brands of PLA. And there's lots of different PLA brands out there. And some of them clog up and jam up if it's close to, if, if it's like 
down around 200. Some of them melt really well, like 190 or 180 even, but you could move it. Like what brand of filament do you have? That is it the one that it came with? No. So oh, okay. I didn't open that film. yet okay. because um, I, I know that filament has a shelf life once it's opened and exposed to the air. And I don't have a, but a PLA will last a long time. PLA will last like a year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's under a year old. Um, but I mean, it's, it, it's Amazon filament. I'll, I'll go look for the brand. If it's, if it's like cheap Amazon filament, then I would say go down to like 200 on it and try that. And that will probably help with your stringing a lot. Um, okay. And usually you might need to kind of play around with like five degrees around 200 because darker filaments usually need a little bit more heat than lighter filaments to melt. And they might cause jamming or clogging or something like that. So if you ever hear it like clicking, like it's having trouble feeding it through or like digs in like a half moon shape in the extruder or something like that yeah. and it's kind of okay. having some pressure build up in there and the and it probably needs to be a little bit hotter so like i would say suggest changing that temperature first and then when you get cure installed then you can kind of change that from i think it's five and 45 to um maybe like another millimeter back um and and kind of see where that goes or maybe two or, or five millimeters back and you can kind of play around with that for your particular uh material and okay. a lot of times too the brands they tell you like the best retraction settings that you would use um as well so you can find those so this is a bowden system if somebody needs it it's called a bowden system printer because the extruder is far away from the nozzle so there's like a distance okay. between. so um that's a way too that you can you can try to find like what's the best you know retraction setting for bowden on you know matter hackers filament or on amazon basics filament or you know Protopost right. or plastic or whatever you're using. Yeah. Or um, Overture is a good one too. Like there's a bunch of different ones that are out there. So it's a Bowden okay. tube system. And then you can type in your brand and the, you know, PLA, if it's PLA, it's, it's PLA. And then like Bowden tube retraction things. And then that can bring up stuff, people that have already kind of tested and done some stuff and maybe like you know, a Reddit post or a blog or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And same thing goes, you can send those messages to support too. And, and we can get you going and, and see if we can dive into there. And same thing, like you can share your G code and we can take a look at that and we can import that and kind of see where the problem might be. Um, and if it's like too hot or, you know, or something along those lines as well. Yeah, looking on the side of the uh, uh, filament cart um, reel, it says uh, 200 to 230. So I'm gonna go all the way down to 200 and see what yeah. it does. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That's a, that, I bet that would be a great place to start then. Yeah, because it like those are the types of things to, to look for, like those little uh, those little measurements. Controller settings. Yeah. Cool. Um, I tried to use the onboard slicer last night. Do I need a persistent internet connection for that? Um, it does need to stay connected to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. so that you, can, you can save it to like the USB and then put it in there in USB and then say print from USB and pick it and then that will slice it. Um, mm -hmm. But if it's a really big file too then it will take a while to slice because it uses, it has a Raspberry Pi inside of it that has to slice it. Okay. So if it's something that's going to be, you know, like more than probably six hours or something, it might take like several minutes to slice because that poor little Raspberry Pi is struggling to try to get it. <laughs> we're trying to find ways, which is why the settings, like the default settings are in there because we're trying to find ways that you can give you more um, control with the onboard slicer, but then not have to like wait for long periods of time as it's trying to slice it and trying to figure it out. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, what kind of Raspberry Pi does it run on? It's a 3B plus. A 3B plus, okay. Yeah. We want to upgrade to a 4, but um, when we first launched, we have the 3B plus, and that's kind of what we've been sticking with. But now that they're almost, like, done using them, um, they're becoming harder and harder to find. Raspberry Pi market is nuts right now. <laughs> uh, I know. I had to uh, – I'm building another project with a Raspberry Pi, okay. and I just needed three of them, and I had to sign up for rpilocator.com to oh, get their right. feed just to get something from Adafruit like before everyone else did it's insane. yeah to, to try to find them and, and yeah and then the prices are like controlled but then they're hard to find and sometimes they take like weeks to arrive and yeah there's a there's a lot of different stuff going on with it yeah I got three and it ended up costing me almost 300 bucks man that's yeah nuts. almost yeah. but uh cool all right so I at least know what I'm putting that machine up against and I'm not trying to make it do something that it's you know not not capable of doing, but we'll take a, a couple of minutes and I'm not, I'm just being impatient essentially. Yeah, it'll just take a little bit of time. 
Um, and we're working on slowing those down, but um, you're going to get way more settings though. If you use like uh, Preacher Slicer or um, or Cura or something like that, you'll get a bunch more settings and a bunch more stuff that you can that you can utilize and kind of dig dive into. Um, and I can send you all those settings too. Same thing. And uh, if you just send a message of support, um, just support at, I'll put that over here. And and then I'll uh, I can send you like those settings if you want to set it up in a third party slicer or something like that. Because you can just choose it from the list in Cura. But if you want to put it in another one, you got to kind of pick some a, a different type of printer and make some modifications and stuff to it. It's a little okay. bit more advanced. Um, but yeah, just uh, whoop, there we go. There you go. Yeah, you just send an email to that, and then um, that I'll get tagged with it, and then uh, yeah, I'll get you going for sure. Man, so helpful. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And that's what we're here for. We want to help you out. Help you. <laughs> so, Matt, um, any questions? How's it going there, man? Hey, it's going well. Um, no, I'm just just logged in over lunch here and just wanted to say hi. Yeah. Oh, well, hey, man. It's been a bit. Yeah. Do you use Carbide Create, Matt? Or do you use Easel? I use Easel. Easel. Um, and uh, I've been been doing okay with easel. It, it's been working okay, but I just used the free one. That's usually the one I used to. I've used Carbide Create uh, once, but I, I use the free version of easel too. I use something called F engrave to to get some V some V carving because uh, easel won't let us do V carving for free. Yeah, that's and true. Uh, that works pretty well. So I'm pretty happy with that too. F engrave. I'm gonna Google that right. F now. F hyphen engrave. Yep. I I use Linux at my house, so Ooh. a lot of the Windows stuff doesn't work. So <laughs> yeah, but F engrave oh. works on both Windows and Linux. So Forge works. Nice. Yeah. That's the one. Awesome. Here, He's I'll got a great you. video about how he does. Uh, he does two part, you know, a two part one where he carves it out and then he carves out the negative and then he sticks them together and cuts them off so you can have like inlays. And I was really interested in that, that part as well. I haven't done one yet, but uh, I'm getting there. So. Matt, what do you usually uh, make with your machine? Um, let's see. I have done a lot of stuff. So oh. let me show you. Cool. Um, somebody commissioned me to make a welcome sign. And so I did it and then he backed out. So I've got it as an example here. <laughs> welcome, welcome. <laughs> yeah. Um, right here. So you'll notice this is, this is from, uh, I think this is a, a thing in free easel here. I put a little pattern in there and then I carved in welcome and I painted it in um, on a sign. Um, I've done boxes with the finger joints mm -hmm. and I live in Texas. So I have a, uh, I have to support the home team. So uh, I have, um, I made a four foot Houston Astros sign. So let me show you that. It's still, I wanted to test my, uh, my ability here. So hang on, let me get the light. Here's a, here's something people don't show you. I screwed up. <laughs> I did a home sign here and I tried to reprint it, but I think the home, the home button or the home location went somewhere else. So it started carving another H into it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just painted this board black and actually I bought it at a, at a garage sale. Somebody had, already painted on this side. So I wanted to do something carved on this side, but I wanted to re redo something and, and I re hit it and it, my, my home changed location. So I screwed it up, but you know, you live and you learn, right? For sure. Um, but since our, since our format is, is four feet, I did this and I did it out of plywood. Oh, that's see. like decking plywood, like outdoor stuff. You can't mm -hmm. really see it, I guess it's, but there no, I, it's I this Houston well. Astros. It was going to take like six hours and then I had to invert a couple of things, but the Houston Astros have a, uh, an SVG on their, on their website. So I could just, 
you know, import that SVG and then, and then I cut it out and I'm going to paint it with the Houston colors and stuff like that. So, you know, um, very nice, but I, I did like, I did some zombies and stuff for our Halloween and I just changed my M2. I had the original M2 and I put mm -hmm. the 12 foot board on wow. and, uh, I just got my, my board to hang on the, the, on the, uh, on the French cleat system that I have working here. So, so that's my setup there. Um, so I have the 12 foot, the 12 foot top board now instead of the 10. Mm -hmm. Let's see, there you go. And then my dust collection is over there. But, but yeah, so that's my, that's my setup. Um, everything works pretty well when you get it dialed in. Um, so I made some, some uh, zombie things for Halloween. I made a Christmas sign for, uh, again, I'm new to Texas. So I made, this is my, my test. Um, and I made this, but I, I large, enlarged it up uh, another couple of feet. And then I, I drilled holes in the heart here and I put Christmas lights in the holes of the heart. So it lit up like a, um, a sign, but it's up in the attic right now because it's not Christmas. So, <laughs> so yeah, so a lot of stuff. Um, and it's been, it's been fun. I just need, I need more SVGs. I got to figure out where to get all these SVGs from. So um, that's what I've been working on. But I worked in Illustrator and Photoshop for a long time. And uh -huh. I used to run a screen printing and embroidery company. So I okay. did a lot of file conversion. And like, I feel like that's the easiest part of all of this. If I can just get my Adobe subscription back uh, when I get my computer back, yeah. I'll be in good shape. But uh, yeah, I, it's, it, it's interesting to see what other people are uh, doing firsthand. And Ren, I don't, it looks like you're in your house right now, but. Uh, I'd still, you know, I, I don't know who's on this call every week, but I'd like to try and make it a little bit more of a habit for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, been um, here in the last couple of weeks. Matt used to be here all the time. I'm here almost every week. <laughs> well, they, they've got me back at work now. And, you know, so some days I can work from home, some days I can't. So I'm trying to make it as much as I can. But uh, I made, uh, since at work, I don't have a standing desk and I have a standing desk here at home. I made uh, something that'll sit on top of a table that'll be a standing desk and it breaks down in the plywood components so um, so that you can you can make your regular desk a standing desk if you want to. So oh, I, I did that and I, I kind of went a little crazy on it and painted it all up and but that's at work right now. So, um, you know, so all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, somebody commissioned me to make some uh, beware of dog signs. So I really made some some cool stuff there, and again, just an easel, and it was uh, it was pretty easy to, you know, to kind of, you know, lay it out and then cut it out. So I got some I got some cedar that I made those out of, and then I test cut it on the on the plywood that I used for the the Houston Astro sign. It's mm -hmm. supposed to be like decking for a uh, for floors and stuff, and you know, I, I thought maybe it'd be a little bit better for outdoors. But then yeah. I painted all of that, you know, so that it was sealed up. But, you know, I don't know if it'll last. Texas heat and sun <laughs> destroy anything made of wood. So <laughs> I believe it. That's so, Matt, when I'm looking for designs, I, I was practicing making SPGs. Uh -huh. and I, do it in, I do it in Inkscape. And to get my designs, I just Googled whatever I was looking for, whatever, you know, picture I was looking for. Yep. And uh, went to images and then in the tools of Google, I went to line drawings okay. and found a line drawing that I liked and yep. brought it into Inkscape and just created my SVG in Inkscape. And it took me, I probably got, I ain't kidding you, I probably got 30 different projects right now mm -hmm. that I could do just because I was practicing, you know, okay. making the SVGs. It's, it, when you figure it out, it takes a little bit, when you figure it out, it's super stinking easy to do that and find okay. designs. You don't have to go out and buy SVGs and stuff. Okay. Well, I've, I've, I've bought some and I've looked online and searched for some and things like that. So it's been, it's been hit and miss. Like some of the ones I bought were, you know, not very good. Um, but you can convert like a PNG to a SVG, you know, with, with Inkscape and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Right. So Lauren, oh, oh. 
Lauren has a really good tutorial that he did on one of okay. these calls that uh, that I recorded and put on our YouTube. Let me, okay. I need to go find that link where he just oh, yeah. finds a picture and then mm -hmm. puts it in Inkscape and turns it into an SVG and then, so he can turn it into and take it and bring it into easel. And he does yeah. like, just what Ren said of like kind of how you do that and how you zoom in to make sure like little lines that might be too close. Cause it might look like it's going to work. It's kind of yep. the same way with 3d printing models too. It's like the model might look like it's going to work, but then when you get close, it doesn't work because the lines are too close together or something like that. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, there you go. In this of? The of, the of didn't work. Yeah, it was so close, and I thought that I had it. And when I looked again uh, in Easel, it was indeed. Like, uh, yeah. Like, yeah, you really got to. like zooming in to see, like zooming way in on stuff. The zoom in, this is the zoom in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, let me find that. I'm going to go find that right now on YouTube. Yeah, Lauren's the one that taught me. I mean, I couldn't believe that he right. actually took about it. Okay more than an hour of his time early in the morning to get yeah. on and just walk me through and give me a really good tutorial. It was yeah, awesome. Lauren's a great guy. Yeah. I been, I've been going to a lot of these, um, uh, meeting meetups for a while, but, uh, Lauren's always got some good ideas and, and he's always trying to push his M2 to the limit. So, um, yeah. You, are you making one out of metal? Did I hear you making a frame out of metal? I did a metal frame. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've actually got a bunch of videos that I'm trying to get off my phone. And, and when mm -hmm. I do, I'll put a movie together and I'll throw it up on the Facebook page so you can see it. Okay. Is it steel or aluminum or what? Steel. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, what do you call it that they use for electrical? It's like a C channel. I can't remember what it's called. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, conduit or uh, yes. super strut. Super strut. Yeah. Okay. Which okay. actually was hard to get when I was trying to buy it because nobody had it, it was out of it. You know, the, the supply had diminished. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> one of the challenging things for me was I, I built this uh, French cleat wall and I really wanted to put the frame on the French cleat wall because I before I had the top part, the top beam on the French cleat wall and the frame would sit on the ground. Well, my, my floor isn't level, right? My garage floor kind of, you know, runs out of the garage. So, you know, I had it propped up on a couple of, you know, shims and stuff, but, you know, after you make stuff for such a long time, you know, the shims come loose or they get kicked out or something happens and they just didn't, didn't stay there. And I thought, wow, it'd be really great if I could make it, you know, fit on the, on the, uh, on the French cleat, but there's, it's so heavy. The frame that I built is so heavy. I had to re-engineer it a couple of times. I, I think I tried three different designs and I finally got it up on the wall, but, but but yeah, it's been uh, it's been challenging, and I'm I because I, I know that the French cleats are are um, horizontal um, with everything. So if I could get it to mount to that, then I had it, you know, I had a better chance at getting everything more accurate. So and yeah. you've had yours for about a year, right, Matt? I no, think. it's been it's been like it's been a while. I think it's been two years. Um, I bought it right awesome. at the beginning, you know, and it's just been a great great tool. But it, you know. The, the the price for for plywood's gone up and then gone down so you know now it's better but uh when the place of price of plywood was really high i still had a, a a leftover stock of plywood so i didn't have to buy it when it was stupid hot you know or too too expensive so um so yeah it's been uh, it's been up and down so but yeah i've had it for i think two years um i think 2020 is when i purchased it but i don't know yeah, that's when it launched in yep. the summer of 2020. Yep, yep. Yeah. So it's been through a couple of iterations and stuff since then, but yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah. And I've been following everything and I, I need to get the laser and everything, but I just haven't pulled the trigger yet. I've been working on that frame for the French cleats and I just oh, yeah. haven't been out there. So yeah. I got a I bought a a wooden PC frame and I built a new PC. And I was looking at it. And I'm like, eh, I could do better than this. But, you know, everything was so tediously laid out and everything was really uh, special in there. I just didn't have the, you know, the time and the effort to go and sit there and figure out where all the holes have to be drilled and, you know, all that stuff. So like your computers, like, is a, is wooden? Yeah, it is. The, the, the I'll box. show you. I That's can show awesome. you here. Hang on. <laughs> I just, I just finished that up. And how does that well, work with cooling? It doesn't get too hot. And well, it's in a it's got fans and got fan mounts and everything. So hang on. 
Um, so it's like a like a DIY. You can build your own computer. Like, all right. So like right here. Oh, that deck. Oh, I remember. No, you no, 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 no. This thing here. That, right right here. there. Yeah. So it's it's, it's made like laser. Out of, it's made out of wood, and then they flat packed it. But there's holes for screws and oh, yeah. holes to put it together. And then um, here, I can see if I can get it. That out. matches that standing desk perfectly. Can you? I see remember it? you talking about the standing desk. Yeah, the standing desk I built myself. So it's got plexiglass and a window and everything. And I see myself in it. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it it was uh, it was it was something that I didn't want to attempt on my own an easel just yet. Yeah, that's there's a lot of little intricate parts, and yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, I made a bike rack, Pac Man bike rack called Pack Rack. Uh, okay. And that was the to doing the slots. That was the thing that was tough for me to do to try to, and I had to do some test cuts on the slots to see like what the tolerance was going to work. Sure. Wood. And then I did in the corner uh, when I actually did it on my on my three quarter inch. Then I did the actual test cut to make sure it's like okay, are my calculations right? And I was like, no, it's a little bit too loose because I wanted it so I could like kind of knock it in there with a mallet with some wood glue and then it would stay. And uh, and it took it took some time to like get the tolerances just right um, and figuring it out. And I think I ended up being um, about a millimeter and a half all yeah. the way around. That worked for what I was doing. But I was using okay. a pretty good bit. I was using like a fourth inch bit to cut it out. So um, uh, and that I've took got a bike rack here too that I made. You can you can see that I like bicycles. Oh yeah, nice. Yeah, so I've got a bike rack that I made too, and I'll show you. I went through multiple iterations. This might be interesting here. Hang on, let me roll oh, this stuff up. I'll get out to an area where you can see better. But I went through three iterations on bike racks as well, and uh, like you said, it was hard to get the the tolerances Lots just right. Work. Yeah. So. Hang on. Okay. So you see that one? Yeah. Okay. Well, this one's version three. So hold, hold on to that. I think version one, I built it like this, right? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to flat pack it. So I built this for, I have fat bikes, which have five inch wide tires. Yeah. And I have road bikes that have like basically one inch tires. So I wanted to be able to make it adjustable and stand up. So I, I built these in easel and this is my own design. So this is version one. Well, it turns out the wheels, it, it, the, these vertical supports here weren't even touching the wheels. The wheels were way out here and yeah. it didn't, didn't work at all. And I made these these supports too thin because the thing would tip side to side as well. So that's version one. Then I made version two. I kicked it back a little bit because I needed the, I wanted these vertical supports to support the wheel. Mm -hmm. and I made these longer. So and this is yeah, on your wall? Is this on that? your wall? What? Is it on your wall? Is it mounted on your wall? No, is, these are for like in the garage, in the garage. Uh, for, okay. for floor mounted stuff. Just to get them off the, off the ground. Right. Yeah. The ones in the wall are, yeah, they're made, they're mounted, they're mounted differently, but, but anyways, yeah, you had to get this one and then this one didn't work either. It, it had some, some flaws in the, in the size of, of everything. So this one, you know, obviously didn't work as well. So then I went with version three, maybe this one's for four. Yeah, because the other one, this one has shorter ones. But in any case, I've made three different versions because I had to lay them back a little bit more and I had to make it wider. And eventually I figured it out. So so anyways, there you go. Yeah. So that's that's the one now. Um, and then these these support the wheels better when they're laid back. But I just at first yeah, that won't follow it. Up. <laughs> so so those are they're supposed to be from my garage and just to be able to set the bikes in, but that's what it is. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, was that was that the hardest part of that? Was kind of getting making sure that those were those were setting up like they're supposed to be and and like those tolerances were fitting? Yeah, well, no, the actual I mean, I was able to get these tolerances working just right pretty much from the first iteration. Um 
but the you know getting the bike to fit in it and stand up that was <laughs> that was tough yeah because it's heavy it's one to like lean over and yeah it, yeah it wanted to lean it over and, and and break the piece and stuff so yeah and you know i'm a software engineer not a mechanical engineer so you know some of this stuff was new to me and and uh you know a lot more fun and challenging to to try so yeah so course. anyways well thanks for sharing yeah mm -hmm. that's awesome what kind of software do you engineer? Um, I work with Linux, which, as I mentioned, um, so mm -hmm. I have a lot of Linux machines in my house here and at work. So I work on uh, I work on Linux software. So okay, that kind of stuff. Any you know, I, I manage VMs and things like that. Awesome. Yeah, right on. Yeah, I'm learning Python right now. Yeah, Python. I love Python. It's great. Oh yeah. Yeah, a lot of fun. Uh, I use Python a lot. Do you? Well, yeah. man, I'd like to talk to you. At least pick your brains on some stuff because <laughs> sure. I can usually figure stuff out, but boy, um, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it is. It is. It's very powerful and, and, and it's very quick to write stuff. I used to work a lot with Java and okay. uh, that it takes a lot longer to write a program in Java than it does Python. Python can be done pretty quickly, so... It works oh, out pretty well. And that's why I tend to use Python quite a bit when I need something done. And, and usually I have to do it pretty fast. So, <laughs> so that's I, why uh, I use Python. I don't know if anybody here is into the Grateful Dead, but uh, they have a project called the Grateful Dead Time Machine. Oh. And uh, it's written in Python and okay. it accesses the archive.org servers. Oh. Um, and they recently uh, upgraded support for another band that I follow, Fish. And uh, yeah. so I'm making some changes to make it a more fish oriented uh, experience. So okay. that's what I'm doing. Okay, yeah. And I'll be using all these things together. I'm gonna cut uh, the enclosure for it um, on uh, the M2 and build all the knobs for it with the uh, 300X. So I'm really awesome. excited. For the server? Um, so for if, you, if you go to spurtilo.com. You're leaving art C, right? Spertilio? Uh, S P E R T I L O dot net. So I bet our director of ops knows about this. He was actually just went to like three fish shows this past weekend. Did he look at Madison Square Garden? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, he loved it. He came back talking about how great it was. Um, yes. I'm gonna, I'll share this with him. Oh, he's going to yeah. love that. So you're going to make this for fish so you can back up. And watch so, the shows. Oh man, he's gonna. Love, I'm gonna share this with upgraded you. support for fish. So you can go to fish.in. And yeah. here, hang on just a second. I just built the bear case myself. Oh man, soldered it all together. Nice. It's powered that's up awesome. Now, but, um, so yeah, that's what I, you're getting the pies for. What's that? That's what you're getting those Raspberry Pis for. Yes, it's exactly what I was getting for. Um, but I'm going to build an e-ink display for it. Um, it's got a color display, but it's like really small and, uh, I'm kind of wanting to upgrade the experience. So, uh, they have 3d printed enclosures and they're nice, but, uh, I wanted to make something a little, um, that looks like a vintage receiver, if you will. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's awesome. So you're going to, are you going to go and, and take that and sell it to shows and, or, and sell that's, it on like the fish marketplace and stuff like that. That's so hopeful. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's like the long term mm -hmm. uh, goal. Um, but learning Python is like the biggest obstacle right now because I'm trying to rewrite the code for this display to be a larger e ink display and then finding all of the uh, commands for like color and have to change it back to black and white, like really just understanding how uh, they communicate. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's awesome. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty psyched. Well, Rob, <clears throat> I can't I can't emphasize enough flat pack are the way to go. Like I ordered this this computer case and it came all flat packed all together. Mm -hmm. And then it was one big envelope and it was a lot cheaper to ship that way than it was, you know, like those normal cases come in a big box and it's, mm -hmm. it's a huge, it's a huge uh you know, uh, three dimensional thing, but if you can make everything flat pack and then, you know, fit it together with either finger joints or whatever, 
that would be the way to go because you know that that would be easier for shipping and, and production. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. 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 Well, that's that's gonna be rad. I'm gonna I'm gonna share that with Matt. He's gonna love that. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> if you send us a message in support or send us a message like uh, he's, uh, he might contact you. <laughs> Talk to you about <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but yeah, that's great. Uh, cool. Well, uh, we'll be in touch a lot more. Uh, I thought this was going to be like a, a one month project, but it looks like it's going to be like a couple of months, if not like probably, you yeah. know, for the rest of the year kind of thing. Long-term reward. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Well, Drew, thank you very much, uh, Matt. Thank you. It was great to meet you, Matt. Good to mm -hmm. see you again, Drew. Yeah, for sure. And uh, uh, yeah, be here on Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. Right so, on. All right. We'll, we'll see you all later. See you guys. One. See you, Matt. Are you leaving too? Yep. Gosh, I just ran everybody off.